As the centuries advanced, European trade and colonization meant that where people of the West were once characterized as dwelling with want and scarcity, they were now accustomed to a much more comfortable way of life. Luxuries like cotton, coffee and chocolate, once exotic and expensive, became widely available and a large middle class population had grown off the back of the financial successes of the bankers, merchants and traders of the Renaissance. Education and information that was once considered obscure was now common, and the esoteric practices of the alchemists, heavy with symbolism and spirituality, were stripped down to a hard, rational science. As cultural aspirations shifted from the noble and the spiritual, the castles and cathedrals that once stood at the centre of European life were replaced by markets and banks. With this newfound comfort and confidence, the ancient stories and ideas which had now been spread all around the world through European expansion and exploration faced new criticism from an empowered and educated middle class. The 17th century saw the beginnings of what later became known as the Age of Enlightenment. During this time, academics and intellectuals believed logic, materialism, rationality and a scientific scepticism was like a bright lamp they could hold up to all ideas and problems in order to confirm their validity and discover cogent solutions. In this way, their view of the world would be enlightened. By stripping away superstition, bias and human judgment, looking only at the arrangement of measurable and replicable facts of matter, new discoveries could be made with objective verifiability and new systems could be devised with no need to pay regard to the seemingly outmoded guiding principles of the past. In 1751, French writer Denis Diderot published the first encyclopedia, a systematic dictionary of the sciences, arts and crafts. In the introduction, he wrote, All things must be examined, debated, investigated without exception and without regard for anyone's feelings. We must run roughshod over ancient puerilities, overturn the barriers that reason never erected, give back to the arts and sciences the liberty that is so precious to them. We have for quite some time needed a reasoning age where men would no longer seek the rules in classical authors, but in nature. This scientific worldview allowed us to strip away human perception from our judgment. The patterns which the generations before had recognised and lived by were disregarded, and the natural world was observed without consideration of its relation to our subjective experience or any wider connection in meaning and virtue. During the Enlightenment, mere practicality and objectivity became the sole motivation of existence. Human beings were understood to be material bodies, and human life became a calculation maximizing happiness and minimizing pain. Adam Smith, a Scottish economist and university lecturer, was a prominent figure of the Enlightenment. He was known as the father of economics for the impact of his influential book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. In this book, he introduces concepts such as supply and demand and the division of labor. He also likened relationships of brotherly altruism to the relationship of a pet dog to its owner, and a rational self-interest as the practical and necessary mode of the successful civilised man. Nobody ever saw a dog make a fair and deliberate exchange of one bone for another with another dog. Nobody ever saw one animal by its gestures and natural cries signify to another, this is mine, that yours, and I am willing to give this for that. When an animal wants to obtain something, either of a man or another animal, it has no other means of persuasion but to gain the favour of those whose service it requires. A puppy fawns on its dam, and a spaniel endeavours by a thousand attractions to engage the attention of its master who is at dinner when it wants to be fed by him. Man sometimes uses the same arts with his brethren and when he has no other means of engaging them to act according to his inclinations, endeavours by every servile and fawning attention to obtain their goodwill. He has not time, however, to do this upon every occasion. 
in civilized society, he stands at all times in need of the cooperation and assistance of great multitudes, while his whole life is scarce sufficient to gain the friendship of a few persons. In almost every other race of animals, each individual, when it has grown up to maturity, is entirely independent and in its natural state has occasion for the assistance of no other living creatures. But man has almost constant occasion for the help of his brethren, and it is in vain for him to expect it from their benevolence only. He will be more likely to prevail if he can interest their self-love in his favour, and show them that it is for their own advantage to do for him what he requires of them. Whoever offers to another a bargain of any kind proposes to do this. Give me that which I want, and you shall have this which you want, is the meaning of every such offer. And it is in this manner that we obtain from one another the far greater part of those good offices in which we stand in need of. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. Nobody but a beggar chooses to depend chiefly upon the benevolence of his fellow citizens.